Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Arnie Lukes here at the Crossroads, and I'd like to welcome Alan Moran. Welcome, Alan. Hi, Arnie. No worries. Pleased to have you, Alan. I understand you've recently been travelling across to go to a seminar or something overseas, and I'm keenly interested in your in your uh, report. So you've got the floor. Uh -huh. Yes, I went to a meeting of uh, an organisation called the Mont Pelerin Society, mm -hmm. uh, which was actually in California. Uh, the society was formed just after World War II, when the prevailing view around the intelligentsia, if you like, was that socialism is the coming thing. Uh, you know, th there was an increasing role for world government, uh, and that uh, uh, we, we really ought to be talking about uh, a different sort of property right from that which had been evolved throughout uh, the, the free markets. Uh, the uh, and the, the group met uh, actually it's called the Mont Pelerin Society because they met in in Switzerland uh, in uh, under in Mont Pelerin which is a, a major mountain there and uh, essentially they evolved a series of meetings usually annually uh, to address particular issues and to actually form form the sort of um, political agenda the kind of blueprint about what a good society would be and how much superior uh, free markets based on property rights and and, uh, and various things institutions like the family etc would be in terms of, uh, of, of prosperity and in terms of, of, of economic freedom mm -hmm. and uh, basically they've uh, they, they evolved and they met met in these these various occasions year by year and uh, you know in in the first years after world war two there was that kind of march of socialism and it was brought to something of a halt by two politicians who were who were very much in line with the Mont Pelerin views, and, and many of them knew the leading lights. Uh, many of the leading lights knew these two politicians, Thatcher and Reagan, of course. Uh, okay. and, and it led to uh, then a, a review of how we ought to downsize government, uh, and there was quite a lot of deregulation. There wasn't really much. Uh, de there wasn't really much in terms of downsizing of the of the budget, but we saw less government interference and control, and that brought uh, a period of you know, considerable prosperity in the West. And of course, that prosperity coincided with the growing uh, sclerosis, if you like, of the of the Soviet uh, model and and, mm -hmm. and uh, its total collapse by 1990. Uh, and you know, from then onwards, it, it, it was then declared a victory in the Cold War, victory for capitalism, if you like, free, free markets, uh -huh. uh, or socialism. Uh -huh. One of the things that we've seen over recent years is the creeping back of that socialism and, and communism. I think you described it in one way, which uh, it, it, which is the centralisation, the United Nations having this, uh, mm. be, United Nations being controlled by elites. Mm -hmm. and seeking to uh, control national e agendas and national economies. <clears throat> uh, but he, even without that, we've seen this uh, newfound socialism come through, uh, and, and especially in, in the more recent years. In fact, if we're looking at, at, at the two, two of the three leading candidates in the US Democratic Party uh, uh, presidential elections, Elizabeth Warren and Sa Bernie Sanders, mm -hmm. are pretty well pretty well what we would have called communism communists not long ago indeed i think uh, sanders really really does call himself that sometimes uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, and we've also seen in other countries uh, a growing uh, increase in in uh, socialist takeovers in in latin america for example uh, until recent years the model was was chile chile was the fastest had been the fastest growing country uh, it had even though it was under the dictatorship at one side says it had totally deregulated its economy mm -hmm. and was achieving growth rates of six or seven percent a year which mm -hmm. was unheard of in latin american most latin american countries countries mm -hmm. did follow suit then but we always had the outliers and and uh, cuba of course being one but then venezuela which which adopted uh, it had been the i guess well, the, the, the third most prosperous country in the americas after the us and canada uh, and with with massive oil reserves, etc., and that that uh, ten or twelve years ago decided it was going to take a socialist route and nationalise most um, 
a great many of the industries, the oil industry, and, uh -huh. and have punitive taxation levels which are re redistributed. And of course, now we've got to the situation where, where Venezuela has, has dropped from, uh, you know, the fifth fifth most prosperous to just about the least prosperous country in in Latin America. And uh, and not only has it has it failed as an economy, but it's become uh, the normal sorts of dictatorship that we've seen in the socialist world with with people being being uh, arrested and for their views, etc., and, and not being at the ele elections being fixed. So we've got a situation where there was this triumph, if you like, over socialism uh, in the in the you know 50 years or so post uh, World War II, uh, and and it's sort of coming back a bit. Uh, you, you got a lot in the American gender, you, a lot of people saying, well, this system isn't working for us, and uh, it, and they back it up by figures. Some of them are kind of spurious, but. The, the 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 system is working insofar as just about every every uh, income strata has seen increased uh, living standards, increased income in real terms over the past thirty years. But the the relativities have moved somewhat. We have seen uh, the richest uh, saga get richer, and the poorest saga not get poorer, but not get as rich. And this has actually led to the politics of of envy, and and in some degree it, it's creating a bit of a crisis in. In capitalism, insofar as that you know, there are more voices now calling for more government control over over the way we live and the way we en interact and the way we, we we spend our money, than has been the case for a great many years, and uh, and not, and this is leading to quite severe uh, changes. And I mentioned Venezuela, but the Chile, who which was the poster child in Latin America okay. of free markets, is now more almost in a revolution. Uh, into, uh, over, over started, it was something which has started about an increase in, in metro fares, but that suddenly became people on the streets demanding higher pensions and, uh, and uh, you know, more equality and control of the factories and whatnot. Uh, again, lead, uh, is a serious situation. So we've got a sort of a crisis of, of capitalism uh, which has come on to us in the Western world. Meanwhile, the, the Eastern world, if you like, in, uh, China in particular, which was, of course, communist, but India, which was very, very much a controlled economy and, and a failing economy until oh, 20 years ago, right. um, have, have very much liberalized their, 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 uh, the way they operate and the government controls have been lifted uh, in China, China and India and led to these great successes. Uh, China, of course, is, is rivaling the United States in terms of the size of its economy, but of course, in terms of the per capita incomes. And India has been going quite quite impressively over recent years. Uh -huh. So we've got this uh, dichotomy going on. The Western world, which led the way in terms of, of developing free markets, has seen these decay somewhat over the over recent years. And, and a, a grow, a, a some, you might say, a, a disillusionment in free markets, perhaps spuriously there, but nonetheless there. Uh, and at the same time, you've seen the, the more rigid economies uh, and, and, and which were poverty-stricken economies have, have actually developed uh, a greater deal, a greater amount of the free market uh, facets and, and, uh, uh, and basic formats uh, and, as, and, and are prospering as a result. So the, there is that kind of dilemma being addressed uh, in, in you know, organizations like uh, the Mont Pelerin Society. Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a, an interesting report, Alan. And, and I think I was thinking of the meaning of words in uh, in what you were saying because the liberal democracy liberalism laissez-faire to me are a sort of um an individualistic orientated type of point of view and that is um, i think it would align with something like say jordan peterson's dominance hierarchy where um, um people will aspire for the top and they'll actually achieve getting to the top um i i see it as something that's sort of orientated towards Darwinism, if you like, um, survival of the fittest type thing. And uh, and I get concerned about it in a sense because th this backdrop we've got, which is the, um, which is the actual um, gauging Watergate at um, Griffith in New South Wales. I took a photo of it, I think it is. And they're actually suffering at the moment because of, um, if you like, the exploitation, not of, not of just a little bit, but actually the whole nation, the exploitation of the price of water. Um, I noted in a, the press the other day, it talked about if we had turned 
one river inland, then we would have a sufficiency and the price of water wouldn't be exploited against the whole nation. Now, I'm suggesting that in a, if you like, a laissez-faire perspective, a whole nation can be actually um, seized upon for a, an opportunity by, if you like, an individual or even a small group of individuals. And in the case of our water increasing 500%, um, to me that's a very good example of, of how individuals making profit uh, can actually hurt an entire nation. The cost of water, the cost of food, or if it's the cost of energy up 200%, then it's the cost of all industry, and that has to affect every single family. So to me, the idea of laissez-faire, um, while it sort of presents itself as freedom, um, in actual fact, it's, it's an opportunity for individual exploitation. I know this is a different point of view, um, than yours, and I respect that, and I acknowledge that, that it is a different point of view, but to me it's very important to look at the, if you like, the social consequences of policy, and if that, if an individual getting ahead can hurt a whole community, a whole town, a whole nation, then surely there needs to be a, if you like, some sort of reins placed on them. Your thoughts, Alan? Well, I mean, there are. There's certainly, a, if an individual getting ahead means the individual exploits the demand for a product and is able to then jack the price up, that mm -hmm. that's something that that almost has always been uh, laws against that. And we have the ACCC and various institutions here with laws against that. Uh, the the case that you're talking about, though, isn't individuals. I mean, it's many individuals. I mean, that it's mm -hmm. not a not oper operating as a monopoly. They're responding to the fact that the, the demand for water is very high at the same time as the government has actually reduced the supply of water to irrigators by, by insisting on an increasing amount being uh, fed into environmental uh, uh, uses, which, mm -hmm. which, which, deplete, which depletes the amount available to irrigators. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and uh, the smart people, if you like, people are smarter than us too anyway, uh, have... Uh, have seized upon that and said and, and estimated that, that is actually going to create a higher price for war. So they bought up the supplies, and lo and behold, the price is higher. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not exploiting it insofar it, it, they're just they're not exploiting it in the sense that you mean that, that they're supplying the water. They're not they're not taking the water away or or exporting it anywhere. They're supplying the water to farmers uh, to those farmers who will pay the highest price, just mm -hmm. like anybody does. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't see that as in any way uh, a, a con, a, 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 an area for condemning laissez-faire, basically an area for condemning government intervention into the marketplace mm. and, and restricting supplies at a time when demand is very high. And those people who are making money from it, well, they're basically offering their, their, their asset, which they, now, they own the water, to the people who, who are prepared to pay more. I okay. mean, how else would you do it? You, you, you could say, well, we, we, we could have a, a tally board of who are the most worthy people, and you and I would, would top that list, I'm sure, and we'd get the, our water supplies and you know, a tally board of people who aren't worthy, and they wouldn't get theirs. Well, we see that sort of thing with the present kerfuffle with the sports minister who's you know, magically uh, allocating uh, funding for sports club to clubs to those who happen to be uh, electing... Uh, National or Liberal Party members, uh, you know, I mean, and that's that's the kind of allocation you get if you don't use the price system. I, I see a, a slightly different take on that, Alan, um, and it's actually in one of the documents that you've brought up. You talked about the incomes across America, and you highlighted statistically within those incomes that the middle class, if you like, the middle strata, is actually mm. has significantly lost ground to the to the higher strata. Um, the, mm. the middle class, if you like, I call them. If you use them, I'm going to use it a an a, a, a now. What's it called? It's an emotional term. Kulags. I'm going to call them kulags, the middle class. And in America, the kulags, the middle class, are actually losing ground significantly. And I might put it to you that the middle class in Australia, those irrigators, those farmers, in the end, the people who buy the food that comes from the water, they're losing ground significantly to the detriment of those, if you like, in the higher strata who are actually taking advantage of increasing the water as a commodity, as an essential commodity, they're increasing the, the price of water five times. I agree the government policy is wrong, 
But I also highlight that the that the former merchant banker, Malcolm Turnbull, was responsible for designing this policy. Conservative government calls themselves conservative, nothing like it. He's, in my view, he is definitely a liberal, definitely laissez-faire, and definitely trying to exploit... No laissez-faire about Malcolm Turnbull, except as far as it supports his policy. Malcolm Turnbull has transformed markets. He created the situation mm -hmm. whereby... Uh, energy, you mentioned energy uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, and water were 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 taxed of various forms of energy and water were taxed in sort of way, in ways that that actually benefited him or his family businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, essentially, there's, that's not laissez laissez faire is where the government actually holds the ring. It, it, it create it, it has the law, it administers the law, and individuals then work within the law. When the government becomes the law and can change the law to 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 uh, meet its own members uh, 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 preferences and interests then you have forms of socialism and and malcolm turnbull was archetypical to socialist in that respect he may have been a merchant banker and there are many more like him who are merchant bankers worldwide mm. Who, mm. Are, who are pursuing the same goals that i mean one of the uk firms uh, uh, banking firms it actually subsidizes pays money to the extinction rebellion for example mm -hmm. uh were these people these people then target uh, target energy firms target firms who they don't who are thinking of using too much water or too much whatever mm -hmm. uh creating a crisis for these firms this 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 merchant bank then buys them at distressed prices and then sells them off mm -hmm. so you know it's actually using using uh, extra legal paralegal people to actually undermine laissez-faire to, to be by exerting sort of political pressures hmm. and, and making profit from it that's that is basically that that's not only is it uh, not laissez-faire it's it's down downright um banditry uh, yeah. in my I, mind i look on i look on well I, I guess definition of words is important laissez-faire to me isn't government laissez-faire is uncontrolled capital and the if you like the um socialism or communism is uncontrolled government both being totalitarian in their end position and i i see and it's it is interesting because the i see the in the in the, in the education institutions both sides of the same coin totalitarianism are presented both sides whether it's whether it's in the marxist socialist side or it's in the, if you like, the uh, monopoly capitalist. I call it laissez-faire. You may call it something different, Alan. But I see the monopoly capitalist and the socialist communist as being both totalitarian, whereas freedom, freedom for the individual, is completely foreign to both those methodologies, both those philosophies, if you like, though, both those points of view. Alan? No, I don't agree. I think laissez-faire basically means you allow composition in there. And you you allow for you know General Motors dominated the motor industry for many many years. Toyota dominated. It looks like Tesla is going to dominate it in mm -hmm. the future. Mm -hmm. That could not be possible under communism. The state rules things, and it doesn't allow competition to come in there. Mm -hmm. Whereas it, it, our system, it allows it to come in. Now you know there are special circumstances where natural monopolies are, are put in place. You know, uh, it, you know people would, would have referred to the Rockefeller monopoly. At the beginning of the, the the 19th century as being one such circumstance whether it was or not uh the governments broke it up into many different firms so they did compete mm -hmm. uh so you, you know the laissez-faire there is is basically firms offering their services offering the goods to consumers and facing other firms offering similar goods or even different goods and having to do so in ways that meet the com consumers needs most efficiently and at lowest cost and that is what's driven the standard of living that's why we have a standard of living like now and not like in the 15th century mm. Mm. i see I, I guess um to me i'm reading i'm listening and, and thinking of the uh, descriptions the adjectives you're using and i see free enterprise as being um some of the descriptors if you like they could actually fit into the category of free enterprise but not necessarily monopoly capitalism those are two different points of view i agree with free enterprise and i think the idea of providing a service um to the community at a fair price and returning you for a profit i think that's a good thing but when it becomes um when it becomes encroaching when it actually is essentially designed for confiscation rather than uh, for the best thing on the market or if you like what is overall best for the community 
I think these are different points of view. Water is, a, is an illustration. Power is an illustration. You mentioned Rockefeller, and we go back to the time of uh, uh, Malcolm Fraser, world parity pricing. And of course, we, we suffered greatly at the, uh, at the cost of fuel being driven through the roof. Now, it wasn't that long ago, um, what was it? Um, uh, fuel was like a dollar a litre. It's now dollar seventy on a bad day. And world parity pricing has helped to bring it up there. And the thing is that um, the production of oil, as just as another example, the price per barrel is back to those days before Malcolm Fraser. And yet the price of fuel is nothing like it. And uh, that to me is exploitive. You don't get it back. Once it's taken from you with these monopolies, you don't get it back. Your thoughts, Alan? I'm not really sure that, I mean, the price of fuel uh, in terms of petrol, I mean, is, mm -hmm. has been dominated by major players who are monopolistic and go, or have some sort of monopoly, monopoly that's OPEC. Um, it, and the price of fuel was, was driven up as a result of that. It's actually been undermined, that high price, by laissez-faire, that is, and shale oil in the United States, basically mm -hmm. a new form of production. Mm -hmm. The United States is now, again, I think just about the biggest producer of oil in the world, which he was last in about 1954, mm -hmm. as a result of innovations there. And that's um, basically reduced. You don't hear much about oil prices anymore. I mean, they're, 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 they're no longer $5 a barrel, but they're basically they've risen to a level of whatever it is now 50 or whatever dollars a barrel mm. but they they went that high because there was there was a shortage and that shortage led to new discoveries being sourced and new means of tapping them mm -hmm. the, the oil being mm. found and which is is the fracking and and, and other productive methods that's right so you know uh it th there is no monopoly producer in the united states there are thousands of producers mm -hmm. thousands Mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, I mean, and the fact that they, these are very uh, nimble and always looking to reduce their costs and exploit market opportunities and various niches in the market has kept the price of oil low, lower than much lower than it would have been. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and indeed, you know, oil is just about the only commodity where you can say uh, there is a potential for monopoly that, you know, we, it's the only commodity where a major commodity where you can say, well, the price has gone up five or six or seven fold over the last 30, 50, 40 years. Um, you know, and, and that's because of a, a special situation which we had in place, which was initially broken by the Saudis and others who, who quadrupled the oil price in the 1970s mm -hmm. and then increased further after that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been, it's been brought in, back in check by the developments of oil discoveries elsewhere. Uh, but and, and especially the the, the new way, means of tapping oil through through using shale oil. That's right. And yeah. that, that's all companies. Yeah. So I don't, you know, I see that I, I understand your point of view that there's exploitation and that I mean you mentioned a fair price. I mean that's that always rings bells with me. A fair price. What does that mean? Because you and I have a different view what a fair price is. Mm -hmm. I I think in terms of market price, mm -hmm. that is the, the the whole constellation of buyers and sellers coming together and and a price evolving from that. Uh -huh. uh, and and it, and if and you, we, we we're talking about the water situation. If it suddenly something happens uh, that to to the supply, that is, the government cuts off a huge, huge bunch of the supply, then the price is going to soar. Uh -huh. And that will happen whenever I, either the price soars, or you have to have a benign dictator, which would preferably be you or I, who allocates it to people who who are most worthy. Uh, and 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 quite frankly, the mo even the most benign di dictator. In my experience and my reading of history and yours too, I assume, you, uh, it turns out to be a despot and start right. start murdering people. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I'm not even sure that, that people like Lenin and Stalin were, were necessarily that bad men when, when they first came into power. But the, you know, they they, they based the basic uh, need that they had to control everything meant that they had to shoot people who who uh, either relinquish that control or shoot people who were standing in their way. And yeah. we we with this appalling situation that uh, occurred there. Yeah, I, I, my understanding of oil and gas, it's interesting you talk about those producers, but in actual fact, what they are is drillers and they control up, up to the wellhead or the distribution, the distribution network. But refineries nowadays uh, in Australia, a lot of refineries have been shut down and there are huge refineries in Singapore and areas like that. And the thing is that most of the, if you like, the opportunity for increased added value 
is owned by giants like it used to be Exxon, SO, Standard Oil, Standard Oil being the original parent company for mobile, SO, Exxon, Texaco, Caltex. And all of these, of course, are coming back under the same umbrella. Anti-monopoly laws disassembled it. But the thing is that these refineries in hubs like Singapore, where the oil gets shipped to, taken out of the wells and shipped to there, and then produced, that's where the markup occurs. So the exploitation, the monopoly is still there. And, uh, and I look on the, if you like, the distribution of water, which is our, our principal subject. There's no reason why we can't increase supply. There is no physical reason. It's just a political will. Do we wish to increase supply and then the price of water will come down? And, exactly. And the, and the fact is that there's no one out there who's beating yeah. that drum, certainly not in the Murray-Darling Basin Authority, because then they would lose their power. And of course, if you're a bureaucrat or a politician, you survive based on power and nothing else. This is your in exactly. end position. It's it's uh, it really is insidious, Alan. I think that's that's right. I mean, it, looking at the oil situation first, and there there are analogies between the two, as you correctly point out. Uh, the the fact is, it, can you imagine somebody saying we're going to build a a million dollars a barrel oil facility in Australia? The green groups would be out. It'd be ten years before it got off the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you want to do that in Singapore? It goes straight away. So what happens then? Well, these oil these facilities, where do they set up? We're going to set them in Australia? Are you kidding? They know they'll have pandas uh, and koala bears all over the place, stopping them doing doing anything. And you have a government which is impotent to stop these these radicals from preventing us earning uh, earning a decent living. That's not there in Singapore. They, they would be they, they would be allowed straight away, and therefore they have these massive facilities. We don't have them. Mm -hmm. In the case of water, well, as I say, there's, there's two aspects. Uh, one is that the government has positively reduced the amount by 20% of water, and that's yeah. created this, this dreadful situation. The other is that um, I mean, there's, many, there's many schemes, and there was one going back called the Bradfield scheme mm -hmm. from way back in the, in the 30s, uh, for turning the waters from the north south mm -hmm. uh, and, and augmenting the supply of water to the irrigated areas uh, of... Uh, Northern Victoria and, and New South Wales. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the thought that somebody might have a plan to put this in, into production, I can, I can just see that the, the, the myriads of hurdles that would be put in their place by government to prevent that happening. I can see that, you know, and, and whereas in China, for example, they you know, had a three gorges policy, they did it and they, they put it in place. Now, you might say that they, they, they kind of rode, rode rough shot over some some communities and, and bought them out uh, at, at uh, cut price prices or whatever. But, you know, they basically said that this is, somebody said this is needed. Uh, we can earn a profit, they didn't quite put it like that. We can grow more food, uh, we'll do it. In Australia, I mean, people keep talking about it, but nobody's put a shovel in the ground, nobody's got a concrete plan yet. And that's partly because, you know, the, the, the impediments, the bureaucratic and political impediments to doing it would be so severe that you'd, 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 it'd be take you a lot longer than you thought it would take you, and it'll cost you a lot more money. You look at the, we, 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 we've gone through this process with a coal mine, a relatively simple coal mine, a darn it. Nine years, nine years of going through the bureaucratic uh, obstacles, uh, and it would have gone even further. It, I mean, it would have never gone ahead under a Labour government. Hmm. You know, the nine years, can you imagine somebody from either uh, 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 somebody who wants to invest in Australia from overseas, or even an Australian wants mm -hmm. to invest, they look at that and think, "Wow, that is adding a, a huge transaction cost to my 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 proposal." Uh, and you know, it, 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 if, it, if it's taking nine years, it's probably doubling the cost mm -hmm. of the proposal. I've got to actually bring a bring something up, Alan, and I guess it's because of my insider knowledge within uh, oil and gas, and that is that Santos built off of the coast of Queensland, build a liquefied natural gas plant. And I understand that there is actually two more built on the same uh, piece of land. New Guinea has built a natural gas plant. And of course, we've also got uh, the natural gas plant at Karatha in Western Australia. And m most of the gas that goes to directed to these five plants are for export. 
And yeah. that's five gas plants. Now, they, they've been constructed in the last 15 years. These are all relatively new installations. In fact, I think that uh, the Santos installation was just starting when I left, um, when I left that company. And uh, so that was, say, six, seven years ago. And, and the thing is that these were given a big tick in the box, environmental ticks in the box, um, and they weren't actually stopped. And, and I put it to you that, the, um, that if you like, the financing of the particular activist groups is actually coming from vested interests. And I know that's a separate subject, but I believe it's an important subject for us to consider that activist groups, environmental groups, can actually do the bidding of other companies. Um, I'm going to just make that statement and I'll give you an opportunity to respond, Alan, and also your closing thoughts. Thank you. Well, I think uh, I think you're probably right. Uh, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they are uh, companies, you know, will finance or will give tacit support to uh, groups that close down their competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact is that the government allows them to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we can see it now where people are saying, oh, well, nobody will ever build a coal mine anymore because, uh, you know, the, the environmentalist. Well, you know, if I've got a coal mine, that's quite that's quite valuable to me. Mm -hmm. But nobody nobody's going to be my competitor. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, good luck to all those those people who are stopping the Johnny Come Lately's coming, who, who might undermine my prices mm -hmm. uh, and 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 uh, you know harm my 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 particular shareholders. So you know they, the government ought to do something about that. That's for sure. Uh, in terms of the amount of oil, yes, there's a lot that gas exported, but I mean the, the the real tragedy in Australia is the stacks and stacks of gas. Mm -hmm. You cannot even look for it in South Australia. Uh, Victoria, Tasmania, or New South Wales, and and it's just been opened on the last few weeks in Northern Territory. So you know we, we have a gas price, which the gas price says is at, uh, at two dollars fifty a gigajoule in the United States. Our price is long, long uh, was that kind of level. It's it, it went up to ten. It's down a bit more since then. But the only reason is that nobody may look for gas. So we've got tightening supplies of mm -hmm. gas, the stacks of gas both for export and for, for local. The price here ought to be pretty much the same as in the United States. They export their gas as well, uh, but this, the price in New York is $2.50 a gigajoule, and it, and it should be that price in Victoria and in, in, the, and, and, and in Adelaide. But the reason why it isn't is because governments have been spooked by activists who say, oh, no, gas is going to harm the planet or mm -hmm. it might hurt, might hurt some, some earthworm or whatever it is, whatever spurious reason they, they want to do. They have, they have prevented people looking for gas and therefore we have less of it available. Yeah, now that's an excellent summary, Alan. That um, My take on it is is that the activists may it, it, at least be doing the bidding of someone else and I think that really, really is important. Thank mm. you so much, Alan. I'm going mm. to cut across and just do a quick spiel on uh, on some websites. Now, this is the Mount Pelerin, Mont Pelerin Society that Alan spoke about. And um, I'll also make a point that the uh, Murray-Darling Basin Authority is actually calling for submissions, the Senate Select Committee, into the uh, constitutional alteration. And I just wanted to highlight that that's actually current until the at least the 6th of March. Um, Alan's webpage, Regulation Economics, and a couple of his articles recently in The Australian, and uh, this other article that's here. And I think that that's really, really important. And I noted, I'll, I'll come back out of that because uh, that's probably enough. I don't need to talk about Scott Morrison because that's only going to distract from, um, from more than enough topics in one day. Alan Moran, this has been beautiful. I've really enjoyed the banter and to discuss different points of view. Thank you so much. Terrific, Arnie. Good program. No Thank worries. you. Good on you. Bye-bye.